Good morning, everybody, and wishing you a very happy Women's Month in South Africa. We are delighted to be hosting the first digital session for the Women in Transport Awards. In September 2021, Durban will play host to the ninth annual Transport Evolution Africa Forum and Expo. This event, as I'm sure you know, will focus on transport infrastructure in road rail and port, technology and innovation solutions, um, drone technology and export and import opportunities between Africa and the world. This all concludes with the Women in Transport Awards, which recognizes the achievements of women in the transport sector. We encourage as many of you as possible to nominate your colleagues and companies so that we can acknowledge and recognize their contributions and achievements in the sector. We have judges advisory board made up of 18 extraordinary women. And over the next several months, we will play host to a series of digital sessions focused on a number of topics, including the challenges, opportunities, and successes of women in the, in the transport sector. Soon, we're hoping to uh, be hosting you in person as well at the event. I'm so pleased that we've partnered again with Moa Global for this uh, Women in Transport webinar. And I'd like to introduce you to Candice Whitefield, one of the directors at Moa Global. Thank you so much and please enjoy. Awesome, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, one of the things I've learned over the, the past few weeks being involved in these discussions is that it is evidence, even though women have increased their footprints and are very involved in the transport industry, there are still obstacles that make working in this sector difficult for women. Women actively contribute to transforming mobility towards a safer, more inclusive and sustainable future, yet their contributions frequently remain unnoticed. It is therefore imperative to focus on increasing the number of women working in the transport sector, as even in 2020, the transport sector is still a heavily male-dominated field. We've all been impacted by COVID-19 this year, and in some way or another, and it has definitely made us focus more on technology. I believe that Africa is only scratching the surface of its true potential for private investment, and a major sector that can benefit from this is the transport industry. The sector will foster economic growth and diversification, job creation, and improve the general welfare of women in this space. I'm excited to introduce the panel to you this morning. Each member of the panel is an expert in their field, and I'm hoping from our discussion today that women are inspired to carry on building a safe, sustainable transport sector in our country and across the globe. Our first panel member is Nikki Scott. Nikki has over 24 years of business Nikki has won numerous awards over the past few years, specifically in the transport and logistics space. Nikki's drive is to bring women to the forefront of the transport and logistics sector to drive employment and build capacity for organizational growth. I won't give too much away because we've asked Nikki to share her story with us, and I'm hoping she can inspire women in, tr in the transport industry to keep motivated stick to their guns, and build real relationships along the way. So over to you, Nikki. Thank you so much, Candice, and thank you, DMG, for this opportunity. So I would like to chat to you about personal growth through adversity. I want to share a few profound business experiences that shaped me into the businesswoman I am today. And I truly hope that you will welcome and be inspired to work through adversity in your careers and businesses. So for today's session, I'm going to start with a quote by Theodore Roosevelt. It's a popular quote, but for the theme of today, since it's woman we're talking to, I've changed the masculine to the feminine. So it will sound slightly different to the one you might know. Here we go. It is not the critic who counts, not the woman who points out how strong women stumble or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the woman who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. 
But she who knows does actually strive to do the deeds. She knows great enthusiasm, great devotion, who spends her time in a worthy cause and who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement. And at worst, if she fails, she fails while daring greatly, so that her place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again. I, this is my personal opinion, but I don't believe that transport is about gender, nor the size of your organization. It's about the ecosystem that you develop that will support you. It's about your personal and your organization's sustainability and your ability to create great value for your stakeholders. Being a woman in this industry just makes it more interesting. I started my first transport related business in 1995 at the age of 22 and people often ask me, you know, were your parents involved? Did your dad start the company? Did you have a background in transport? And the answer to all those questions is absolutely not. I grew up in a small town in KZN called Port Chepston. Those who used to go on holiday on the South Coast would know it. it's not far from Margate, where women aspired to three things. They either married well, they took up employment in traditional female occupations, or they got the hell out of town. My motivation to start my own business stemmed from my upbringing. I had a driving need to please people and to be needed by people to fix problems and to live a different life to the one I grew up in. And I probably could have satisfied those needs in any industry, but I landed in transport, in an industry that was not ready to hear from an ambitious and relentless 22 year old. My first business grew exponentially. Within the first year, I had opened up four branches in the main city centers, managing the logistics of three car rental companies. It was a labor intensive, high risk business that offered a flawless solution to stocking the airports with clean vehicles and clearing the airport of returned uh, dirty vehicles. Our client base grew very quickly and so did our cash flow requirements. What I did not know as a young businesswoman was the cost of exponential growth. By 1998, just three years into the business, we were experiencing severe cash flow problems. I could not sustain the outgoing cash demands of the daily on-road expenses and the weekly wages while waiting 60 days for payment. My bankers introduced me to a potential big brother who was to buy into my business and offer valuable financial assistance. But a year later, the deal had not been concluded. And rather than growing my business, they were strategically suffocating it. I'd begun to question their intentions and their failure to conclude the deal. And this made the relationship very uncomfortable and stressful. I had to decide, would I rather sit and maybe be backed into this big organization or risk exiting the relationship? But the challenge was that over the year, I had backed my business into theirs to create financial efficiencies. When they got wind of my intention to exit the relationship, they sued me for reckless trading. I couldn't understand why they were pursuing this action. They were a multi-billion rand organization. They didn't need my 20 or 30 million turnover. That court case took a year to conclude and the judge, it was a high court, uh, court case, the judge um, awarded in my favor, labeling it one of the worst takeovers he had seen, but that did not stop them. While my case was on the roll, every creditor could see that. And the only way that I could overcome that was to actually liquidate the business. So they challenged the liquidation through the magistrate court for 18 months till eventually I settled, just so that I could move on. There were many lessons in this, experiencing, this experience, ranging from trust to understanding the impact of exponential growth and even understanding myself. I had to dig deep to find the courage, not only reinvent my business, but to trust again. The experience made me more determined to succeed, to be self-sustaining and to be a royal pain in the ass. From January 2000 to 2001, I transitioned my business from moving cars to delivering commercial trucks and buses. My clients were made up of the top manufacturers in South Africa. Our service footprint included all the SADC countries and as far up as Rwanda and Uganda. And while growth was quick, 
I was in a far better position to negotiate contracts and payment terms that supported our massive petty cash outlays of up to 250,000 per day. We delivered around 3,500 vehicles at our peak. We had to be highly innovative to mitigate risk. We were agile, we were responsive to our clients' needs, we were in a highly competitive growth environment and our business flourished. And then the 2008-9 recession hit. In less than a month, I lost 54% market share. The only vehicles that were moving were vehicles moving into stockyards as the banks had absolutely stopped financing all vehicles. To this day, I can still vividly remember the conversations with financiers, with clients and with staff. No one knew when the banks would begin financing. And quite honestly, that experience was not unlike the COVID lockdown where there were no answers, no knowing when business would return to normal and what that new normal would look like. Looking back, I realize now that I did not have the mindset of building a business to sell. I did not establish long-term financial sustainable sustainability strategies. Like many entrepreneurs, I lived out of my business. I used the profits to buy properties and to buy into other companies. I did not have a capital base that could sustain the business for more than possibly four months. Our only saving grace that we were a low asset based company, so our overheads were low. And with the limited income that we generated, we managed to cover our operational costs. But business had taught me to be resilient. And I now acknowledge that this is one of the key qualities of successful business leaders. You see, resilient people have a few strategies that support them. They know that stuff happens. They're really good at choosing where to focus their attention. And they often ask themselves the question, is what I am doing helpful or harming me? It was during the period of the financial recession and the years that followed that I built strong connections with my clients, financiers and suppliers. I had to in order to navigate the business through those tough years. I want to reiterate the value of solid, trusting connections with people versus just having strong networks. I do believe that your network can equal your net wealth. But can you really rely on your network when your, belly, your business goes belly up and you don't know how to put one foot in front of another? In July 2013, oh yes, it gets better. Just four years after the recession, I received a call from my bankers advising me that my debtors book had risen to 24 million, almost two and a half times the value of when they had taken it on. I had initiated a debtors factoring facility um, to help with the financial recovery of our business following the recession. That call was about to uncover what I consider to be one of the most challenging experiences in my business career. You see, I was doing all the right things, regularly meeting with my clients, meeting with my leadership team, pushing growth into new markets. I'd opened a new driver training academy. I was paying attention to my financial reports. But at some level, I had disengaged from the business. And what I did not know was that in my employment was an individual that was more creative than I, who was more capable of manipulating the financial results than I was in detecting those errors. My company had created nine and a half million rand in false invoicing that I would need to repay. And I know that doesn't sound like much when you compare it to the level of fraud that we hear over the news on a weekly basis. But this was a serious situation for me as it brought to question everything I had established in the business. The invoices had been funded by the bank and the cash had been siphoned off through the petty cash. The level of fraud and dishonesty infiltrated three departments, people that I'd worked with for years and trusted emphatically. Looking back, my business should never have survived that incident. The contracts I held with multinationals provided for the suspension of our contracts in the case of gross financial mismanagement. It took six months to uncover the level of damage created in the business during this time. And the banks had also begun to curb my funding until they knew the validity of my debtor's book. I was once again cash strapped and no amount of bootstrapping was going to save this business. 
I had to once again meet with my suppliers and staff to explain the situation. And I can tell you it was absolutely devastating. I just kept remembering that there was one more element to trust that I had not applied. And that was trust, but verify. And I'm going to say it again, trust, but verify. I knew I had a responsibility to meet with my clients, but I wanted to present them with a solution. And for me, there was only one option. I had to sell my company to a large corporate auto competitor. And in fact, I'd actually started that discussion about four months after the fraud was revealed while discussing our options with our auditors and our attorneys. This company had requested that PwC produce a sustainability report, which, which, which revealed that the business only had four months in which to find a financial investor, failing which it would have gone bankrupt. They offered to keep me on as the MD, but they would not buy the business. They were going to save the business. And for me, that sounded all right, because at least I would be able to save my integrity and I would be able to support my customers, because for many customers, we were their sole supplier. But most of all, I didn't want to disappoint my staff, and this was one way of saving my, their jobs. So, um, sure, still quite hard to say these things. Um, I truly believe that as a result of the relationships that I had built over the years and the integrity and authenticity that I showed um, and the, not being fearful of showing my vulnerability, I had inadvertently built the trust that resulted in the most amazing events. My largest client, now bearing in mind that these were multinationals, recapitalized my business through forward funding of their invoices. Two other clients improved their payment terms to assist us with cash flow. And the others simply wanted a monthly reports on our turnaround. Um, none of them suspended our contracts. And in fact, some of them actually renewed contracts in 2014. I did not sell my company. I built it up again, but this time with my eyes wide open until I eventually sold it in 2018 to a JC listed company at my price and on my terms. My greatest fear in life has always been the fear of failure. What would people think of me and how would I recover if I had failed in a previous business? But this is such a naive way of thinking. I grew the most as an individual and as a leader through failure and adversity. I got to experience some of the greatest joys in reinventing myself and my business. But most of all, I got to experience the true value of authentic human connections. There were so many times that I questioned my purpose and my value. I questioned why I pushed so hard to stay in business, why I stay in this arena. And I kept coming back to the same answer, because I belong here. I'm making a difference in the industry and positively impacting on the lives of so many women. I would not allow myself to be defeated from creating new opportunities in this dynamic industry of transport. I do not have clients today. I have friends in industry. I've become very courageous and I know my strengths and weaknesses. And people often ask me, Nikki, why did you sell your business at its peak after you had built it up? And the answer to that question is that I was able to answer a very simple question. Was what I was doing helpful or was it harming me? Ladies, whether you're in business for yourself or work in a business as a professional, my wish for you is that you will allow yourself to grow through adversity. You will find the coping skills to build the networks that truly support your growth, your businesses and your careers. You will stand strong when life throws lemons and you will turn your name into a personal brand because we belong in this arena. Thank you, Candice. Awesome. Thank you so much. A fantastic message and it just shows that, you know, being present in business, it really is, is difficult and, and it is a, a long road. Um, I just have one question for you, and please, anyone on the call, if you do have questions for Nikki, please just go into the question and answers box, um, and then I can obviously direct your questions to her directly. Nikki, one of the questions I have for you is just, what have you done since selling in 2018? 
So I have continued with training and development of entrepreneurs, professionals, um, and women. Um, I am passionate about developing female commercial truck drivers and bus drivers for the industry. Um, I believe that women should be coming into the industry as truck drivers, even though there are safety issues, even though there are macro and micro issues that we need to overcome, um, women belong in this industry as truck drivers. There is a huge amount of evidence that supports the fact that women are great drivers and that we can't argue that. And in the commercial space, they even better. Um, this, we have aligned ourselves with stunning stakeholders like Volvo Trucks, um, Isuzu Trucks, um, banks like Standard Bank, where we have been able to fund these women from being unemployed to getting their, co uh, their commercial license and then being able to participate in the industry and securing them jobs. I also have a second company that works with compliance. So the one is developing the human capital the element and the other is developing um, the compliance element of running a sustainable, agile um, and profitable transport company. And there we use um, RTMS, which is the Road Transport Management System, which is a brilliant solution that basically is a safety net that protects the business and builds compliance. So between those two companies, my business partner and I are pretty busy now. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. I don't have any other questions um, so far, so I'm going to move on. Um, but thank you for that message. It, it really was inspirational for sure. So transport systems can only become truly inclusive and gender responsive if the voices and experiences of at all levels. Our next panel um, member is Nangamso Maponya. Nangamso started her career at the PRC and later moved onto project finance with the DBSA, where she is responsible for infrastructure projects within the transport, logistics, and water sectors. And Gamso has studied across the globe and has recently completed her GMP at Harvard Business School. She has extensive knowledge around the BRT transport system in Johannesburg, as she sits on the Audit and Risk Committee of Pytrans. After listening to what Nikki said and, and shared with us, um, I'd like to start off with a question for you, Nangamso, just with regards to how do we build a safer and more reliable environment for women in the transport and logistics sector? Welcome. Thank you, Candice. And thank you to, to GM, um, DMG Events for this opportunity. I am, yes, indeed, a transport fanatic. I'm an investment professional, but I've spent more than half of the years I've been at the DBSA focusing on transport infrastructure. So one of the, the, my passions, which drove me to include, to, to rather focus on transport sector as part of my master's studies, was the, 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 the way, the, the understanding of the work that we're doing and the impact it has to the users or the beneficiaries of the systems that we are building. So I studied in particular the efficiencies of um, BRT looking at the, the effects of the consolidation of the taxi industry in forming the BRT operating companies. So my focus areas there was to measure the efficiencies from the point of view of cost, time, and safety, but only from the user's perspective, because I really needed to check and test whether the user finds and experiences these efficiencies and benefit from them. So while I was measuring this, then I realized also that I mean, my demographic uh, breakdown was meant to, to balance between males and females, different ages, and so on. However, as I go through the study, the primary research that I was doing, I realized that a lot of the users in off-peak hours are females. And that, to me, simply said, most of the people who use public transport in peak hour are employed people because they are commuting to work and some are commuting to school. And then in between those hours, you have a large group of female users who are either looking for work opportunities or looking for um, business opportunities. 
so it and then and then i then i asked myself while it was not part of my study and i asked myself what is it that we are missing when we when we design these systems and i said and i said look the the, the as much as i studied three areas cost time and safety i then realized that between the taxi i was measuring efficiencies from the point of view of the brt system and comparing it to the fragmented minibus taxi system and then the two fundamental areas which are found very relevant and very um that that affect women the most are the issues of safety and time more than cost so so these are very uh, this these are very fundamental for me because they have an effect on the choices women make around economic participation they can they, they can decide a woman um decision to whether take a job or not take a job we have a, a, a bearing on the type of transport or the the accessibility of a, a transport to get into that job for example you have you have women working you have more males working in the petrol station because of the long hours and the transport available to take them home is more convenient and safer for a man to travel in than for than for a female because it's not convenient it's not safe to travel in the evening or if you look at time the amount of time a woman spends in the public transport between work and home it affects the the their um home their household lifestyle it affects how much time they spend looking after their children doing their household responsibilities yes we may make an argument that we live in an equal society everybody has a responsibility to look after the children do the household chores but the reality in our homes is that women take more of household chores and responsibilities than men so the time a woman spends inside in, in commuting between home and work and vice versa affects the decision they have to make on whether or not to take that and one of the other then issues is it, it, the 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 ripple effect to that is that once they don't take that they make a decision not to take that opportunity they are then prone to gender based violence because they are locked in homes where they can they, they can contribute economically financially they don't they, they can't um, contribute in decision making because they don't have the financial muscle to have the same voice within the household so so there's many areas where we have we don't look at this when we're designing the systems we don't look at the effect it has on the user and the one one of the other areas which 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 i i found like a, a generalistic view that we have is we design these things using an average designing method and if you look at it an average design for a commute, uh, for a public transport user you go into how train the how train seat is designed for european men and that's that's those those are the things that we when we go into these uh, countries these advanced countries and look for systems to to be implemented within our societies we take the average design methods that have been, that are applied in those communities and those societies and bring them in our space and that means that there is an opportunity for a person or for a female who goes to, who travels to work wearing a tight skirt and not being able to use a bus because the platform is not comfortable for her to get to to step into and or they may have an accident and rip the skirt and 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 then it ruins her day or she decides that that's that's not the type of system to use because of the way i dress to work and therefore i miss out on using a brt for example now i have to go back to using taxis or i have to go back and use an um a train an overcrowded train so so my role as an investment professional this is now going back to what nikki was saying that we need to ask ourselves is what we are doing what i'm doing helpful or it's harming me so as the women in transport yes we we will celebrate our participation in the in the transport sector yes we celebrate counting or growing the number of women that are working in this environments that are contributing in the transport sector but we need to ask ourselves a question and say are we doing what we're doing to help ourselves 
Are we in those positions to make decisions that are convenient for ourselves, that are there to enable us to equally participate? It's one thing for us to have access to jobs, to access to opportunities. However, if you look at the role that you have as a woman in the decision-making environment, are you making a difference for the general group of women that have access or that need that, that relies on this system in accessing the same opportunities that you accessed? So now you're asking the question. And Gom, so I just have one question for you around that, um, if you don't mind. What do you see the role of a woman in building that future in the transport sector? Um, okay. I know we had offline previously, you know, we had spoken about investments and, and getting women in decision-making, um, you know, positions so they can drive the change. So mm -hmm. if you can talk around that of, of where you see that role of women in building um, the transport sector going forward. Yes, thanks, thanks for that, Candice. So as an investment professional, I, I see a gap in, uh, in investment products or finance products that can be made available for women to invest in transport systems, existing transport systems, or even start new um, uh, uh, transport companies where they participate as owners. Once you sit in the ownership position, then you're able to drive decision making. You're able to uh, that once you participate in that decision making chain, you can then decide on the planning. You can decide how things are designed or how the systems are operated. But the only way we can achieve that is making sure that where we are, where we have, where we participate, we actually exercise the control. So we, if you have a, 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 you operate in a space of decision making, you exercise the control. You put in the head of a woman and say, "Am I building something that's convenient?" So the investment products that we've come up with, they're very general. They are for the general industry. And I've asked myself, is there a product that focuses on bringing women closer to the operation and the control? of the systems so that you can drive the change at a decision-making level and at the, own, at the ownership level. So, so that's, that's for me. I'll leave it at that for now and then we can continue with the conversation. I'm not sure that Absolutely. that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much, Nungamso. Um, Nikki, I do have a question that's come through on the chat. Um, just in terms of, so far in business, what have you done as a businesswoman to introduce sustainable logistics? Um, that was the, one of the questions that's come through. And then also, if you don't mind, I'm going to throw this one out there as well. Um, how do you feel we know we're building a trustworthy relationship, especially as a woman? And I think that's, you know, um, maybe I can add a little bit of insight towards that as well. Is I think you need to listen to your guts. And, you know, we have the sixth sense as a woman and when you enter a boardroom and you start building relationships with people, you know whether there is instinctively a, that trust that can be built. And Nikki, I don't know if there's anything just in terms of your experience over the last couple of years, if you can add to, to that question. Uh, Candice, you nailed it. It's 100%. You've got to go with your gut instinct. And I think you realize you've built a relationship of trust when you get to the point that there was is fair sharing and exchange of information where your customer is not fearful of telling you what's actually happening in their organization that may actually have an impact on yours or on the greater industry. So, you know, very often you go into meetings and you get very low level information, you walk out no wiser. That is not a relationship of trust. Um, and I think in trust, it's like what I said, I, I believed I had built a level of trust in my organization, but I could never have um, um, predicted that that individual in my company was so capable of persuading people that shouldn't have done the things they did to do what they did. They thought they were enabling the business in some way or other, um, and they didn't realize how detrimental their actions really were. So I think trust is definitely a gut feel thing, um, and it's with experience. Um, be open, be honest, be vulnerable. 
Now, the question around sustainability, um, more so now in these two businesses that I'm busy operating with now, the sustainability that we're working with is in the developing and driver training methods that we're working with, where the better trained, the more well-equipped the driver is to perform his duties, the more sustainable he is in the organization, the more sustainable the organizations become. This sustainability moves through a lower fuel consumption, um, less accidents, less wear and tear on the road infrastructure. But I did mention ROTMS earlier. ROTMS, which is the Road Transport Management System, and people that don't know about it, I'd urge you to go look it up and Google it. It really is a system that supports organizations in developing sustainable transport solutions um, and making themselves more profitable. Um, there is less wear and tear on the roads. And if you are RTMS certified, you get to participate on a PBS fleet. PBS is Performance Based Systems, which is a highly sophisticated trailer that originates from Australia, if I recall. Um, these vehicles can carry up to 72 tons of cargo. Um, they are far more efficient, they're far greener, um, and um, in that way, by us assisting organizations become RTMS certified, we also assist them become more green and more sustainable. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nikki. I think that question leads itself really nicely onto our next panel member, and that's Kati Lewis. Kati has over 25 years experience in the governance and legal work and is currently the sustainability lead at Grinrod. Kati too has won numerous awards in her sector, which includes Standard Bank's top businesswoman of 2019. Kati also studied abroad where she completed her master's in sustainability leadership at Cambridge. Kati, welcome. And I think to get the conversation started, and I hope it's not too simple a question, but I think if you can touch on what is sustainability and how do we link this topic to women in the transport sector? <laughs> Nikki, first of all, I just want to congratulate you. I made notes furiously when you were talking and I made a few notes. First of all, I think you've got your SDG pin on. If I, yes, I the do. camera, yeah, well done, well done. So, so um, Candice, to, to answer your question on what is sustainability and in the transport sector, you know, there are so many different um, definitions of what is sustainability, and I've had some very interesting and, and profound conversations around it. But for me, sustainability is really the study of life. But it all started, I think, in uh, 1987 already with the Brundtland Report, um, Our Common Future, and um, it spoke about sustainable development. And sustainable development, and I'm paraphrasing, is development which um, meets your own needs without compromising future generations' ability to meet their own needs. So this is really like a, a big topic and a big concept where you have concepts like equity, equality, justice, intergenerational justice, and so on. And, and as I said, it's the study of life and it's so broad, you can basically put it in various frameworks. So the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, is a beautiful international framework. As you know, it was introduced by the United Nations um, in 2015 with the Agenda 2030, and Gender Equality is SDG 5. So it, it fits in perfectly in this conversation, but you know, it's not just um, SDG 5, because we have to consider this from a systemic point of view. You know, nothing lives in isolation and everything is connected with everything else. So sustainability is really for me, the interconnections and the interrelationships, um, both Nikki and Nam Gansu were talking about relationships and the importance of trust. Um, and core values that, that underpin these things. You cannot have a sustainable society, a sustainable business, um, a sustainable world, if you don't have these things. So another framework, which is also um, very popular, it was introduced by John Elkington, and he's considered to be the father of sustainability. You know, he referred to people, planet and profit. And then in the next year, 1995, he translated 
it, the triple bottom line, and then the next year it was people, planet, profit. And then in 2015, um, there's been evolution. The SDGs introduced two more Ps as well. So it's peace and um, partnerships. And I believe, and it links back to what Nikki was saying, I believe that those two Ps are so fundamental. And how you, again, connect these things. Think about it. There's no way that we can do what we need to do and that you empower women and that you promote society and that you promote um, environmental wellness if you don't have peace and if you don't have partnerships. So um, that's what I think we can look at. And um, speaking of John Alkington, you know, he's one of my favorite um, lead, lead authors and, and thought leaders. And the beginning of this year, he brought out the book Green Swans. And I've been talking to everyone about green swans. Um, so it's basically asking yourself, how do you, with this mindset, with this sustainability mindset of understanding these core concepts, how do you move from a black swan event to a green swan event? And I think I'm going to leave it at that for now. Thanks, Candice. Absolutely. So I think, you know, we can see that obviously we've all been impacted, and I've said this before in the intro, just with, COVID and um, the coronavirus, and that was a definite black swan event. And um, Kati, how do you, what do you believe and how do you believe COVID has had an impact on the transport um, and sustainability space? And how do we move it from a black swan event to a green swan? Yeah, thanks Candice. So, so I do believe that um, COVID was a black swan event and everybody knows Nassim Taleb's work at Black Swan. And that's an unexpected major event, which has normally got negative consequences, severe negative consequences, but also on a, on a significant scale. Um, some people think it's not, but my interpretation it is because it, you know, it was fairly unexpected. No one saw the, the impact of this. Um, so the, the transport sector was impacted um, quite severely. And you, well, you can see it, there are so many companies releasing their results. For example, Grinrod had its um, interims investor presentation earlier today, and you can see it from the results. So it does not only impact from a financial perspective, but for me, more importantly, it impacts from a social perspective and then um, also environmental. Um, and you must remember that impact is negative and positive. So from an environmental perspective, I'm sure everybody saw, you know, the YouTube videos of all of a sudden there are dolphins in Venice. And you can see the skies in Beijing. And, you know, nature coming back, etc. And you ask yourself, do I really want to go back to what we had? Do we really want to destroy our own habitat? You know, Homo sapiens is the only species that is really trying its best to destroy its habitat. It's just, you know, quite crazy yes, to think really. about this. Yeah, but now from a social perspective, um, you know, trucking moves all over. And for me, it's a huge opportunity to play a significant role in reducing health issues like AIDS, for example, or COVID, or, um, you know, how do you get... Um, medicine across to difficult areas. So there are so many wonderful opportunities that the transport um, industry has to identify these wicked problems, um, which can also be a black swan, and turn them from a black swan to a green swan. So a green swan is where you have the ability through innovative thinking, and Nikki was referring to being very innovative, and I made notes, Nikki. I, <laughs> I just loved your, your speech. I mean, you were talking about it being agile and being adaptive and being resilient. These are all characteristics of a true green swan thinking, which I'm striving to get to. Um, so you use this kind of thinking and how do you then create exponential impact? That is the key for a Green Swan event. So if I can refer to the break, Breakthrough Compass that was also published in um, the uh, Harvard Business Review and included in, in the book Green Swans. The question is, how many people 
can you impact exponentially now remember again it could be negative or positive and obviously we always want to go positive so the question is how many people is it millions or billions that you can impact positively and then also what is the, the extent of your impact again negatively or positively or is it millions or billions of impact and that is why i was so inspired by your story nikki is that you don't have an ego mindset you don't have a small world view. You have a large exponential world view where your systemic approach is not just you or your business or the industry, but it's literally the world. And that's what I'm saying is let's strive to be bold and true women, but also true men as well. Because I mean, I love men. It's not about you know, <laughs> not wanting to be, please men come in. We love you, right? But there's equals. You know, we've got to do this. The, the problems are so wicked. We have to collaborate. We have to find ways of being truly even innovative and transforming those black swans into green swans. Thanks, Candice. Absolutely. So one of the questions that's come through as well, and um, feel free to jump in, but it, what um, Debbie's asked is, what do you think society, corporates, governments, etc., can do to provide a safe environment where women... Um, for women, so they do not become targets of any sort of gender-based violence um, or any sort of harassment. And I think we spoke about that at length as well, Nikki, just in terms of, you know, making safe environments for women in the transport space so that if they are truck drivers, that they, they, they are places that they can stop at when they're doing that long haul and they've got a place to stay and, and they feel safe in, in that environment. Yeah, so um, I did my master's in 2019 and my dissertation or thesis was on the underrepresentation of female commercial truck drivers employed in the transport sector. And what I discovered through that research was that women were, and I'm going to use the phrase I used earlier, but they had gone into the transport sector with their eyes wide open uh, when they became truck or bus drivers. They knew of the, the, the challenges, they knew of the risks that they would potentially be exposed to. Their greatest frustration was that organizations had not implemented the right strategies to actually attract and to recruit women. And because of that, I think it starts there. And what it actually leads to is the fact that many transport organizations haven't gone to the effort to really build a culture that supports inclusivity and diversity. They might have diversity in terms of their um, administration, their finance, HR, maybe at some level operational staff, but the diversity does not go down to the drivers. Um, and I think that until that happens, we're going to have a tough time having a conversation around, um, and I'm looking at this question, uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, because um, we're not, if we're not, if we don't have a culture of diversity and inclusivity in the organization, how do we then have conversations around gender harassment? How do we then create an environment where men and women can work together and learn from each other? You know, and some of the learnerships that I have run for organizations, we've done learnerships where it was all men or just women. And then in one or two, we had a blended environment where men and women were in the same classroom together. It was the most incredible experience to watch these men and women grow at, at, at an academic level. And I know it's very basic, but then when they entered the work, space they didn't then divide off to men and women these they stood together as groups and suddenly that became a working group that worked forward and they protected one another as they went into the actual workspace as truck drivers so I think it's education government is on the right track with um and Cyril's really doing a lot of things around gender harassment but we have such a history around this and it's not going to change overnight um and I think that as long as we, if, if you are an organization, an open mind organization, and you want to bring, and you should be looking at diversity, um, you know, our female training programs address seven of the sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals. Um, we should be addressing this, but I think it's in the conversations and it's in the exposure and the training, create equality through open communication in your organizations and then let those guys and girls work together to support each other. I can't see how else we're going to get it right. 
Absolutely. Kati, I don't know if you can just talk about, you know, you know, around the boardroom table, having policies and procedures in place to drive that type of tra change. Um, you know, you and I have obviously spoken about that previously, so if you can just give some insights to that. Thank you, Candice. Yes, as a um, previous group company secretary for many years, um, I've had the privilege of attending a lot of board meetings and committee meetings and so on. And it really does come from the top, but don't underestimate your own sphere of influence. You know, I think there are many ways to, to skin a cat or to kill a cat. Um, and you've got your hard structures, which are the board structures, but then you've got your more fluid, um, softer structures as well. And for me, those are fascinating. And I'm seeing that a lot more in the new work that I'm doing is where people are getting together and they are creating um, community of practices, so to speak, to drive this. Obviously, if you have a diversity policy and it needs to be inclusive diversity, right? And there's, there's a big difference between diversity and having a policy and having even targets and subscribing to, for example, the UN um, Women Empowerment Principles, which I'm very grateful and happy to say that Grinrod has subscribed to these. Um, but, but living the values and walking the walk and talking the talk. So it means that you bring people in and that you respect and encourage diversity of thinking and all you know the different aspects. So it's not just gender, it's not just race, it's age. And for me, the most important thing is everybody thinks differently. And just because people are different doesn't mean that your view is better than theirs. Just suspend your judgment. Just, you know, be quiet and listen. Listen to what they say. Engage deeply, care and trust and respect. Um, and then hopefully you will get to a better, um, you know, perspective around this. So for me, diversity and inclusive diversity is the responsibility of everybody in the organization. Um, and it's definitely not just the board's responsibility. The policies and the procedures make it much easier and a wonderful and powerful way of, of implementing it in practice is when you look at your core values and everybody should have core values, which is normally in your code of ethics or your business code of business or something. And you map and you look at your core values and you see whether they are effective in your business processes, in your policies, in your structures. And, you know, sometimes it's an eye-opening experience because if you say, I'm all about transparency, well, then live it. Or if you say, I'm truly keen on justice and equity, well, then show it. Um, are, you are you having equal work for equal pay, as an example? Um, you know, so there are so many examples. And as I said, many, very, many powerful ways of, of implementing, it, implementing it in practice. Thanks, Candice. Nikki, there's one question for you that's come through. Um, just in terms of, and I'll read it, it just says this lady um, has found it really difficult to get listed with some of the larger companies. Um, well, she did manage to list with many companies. And I think what her question, what it talks about is that how does she, um, you know, infiltrate into some of those blue chip companies and build those relationships to, to grow that business? Um, you said, yeah, I've noticed as well that many of these spots on contracts are also given to broker companies um, because obviously there's a relationship that's been built. So they'll give it to a friend, or, you know, almost like that country club vibe. Um, my issue is brokers do not own their own fleet as we do. How do we go about approaching these companies differently? So how does she go about approaching those companies to obviously and um, grow business in her space. I was actually reading that question. You know, that's, it's, it's a tough situation. And, and I can attest to that. You know, people would think after 23 years of business experience, it would be easy just to start again. But starting a new business um, in this environment has been as challenging for me as, as she is explaining. Um, I've worked with some blue chip companies um, and we managed to get to them through the tender process. So understanding when the tenders came up and then tendering um, on those contracts. And I think that that's probably the fairest area. We know that there is a directive that 
um, uh, organizations should be spending around 40% of their procurement spend with women-owned companies. Um, so there is opportunity. But what I found very challenging with these big corporates is their terms and conditions of trade are not always conducive to small companies and startups. They are obviously very often very restrictive. Um, you need a really good attorney to de decipher the, um, the contracts that you're going to be signing. And even if you don't agree with the terms and conditions, you're going to have absolutely no leeway to negotiate. They're not there to negotiate with you. You're going to have to accept them and know what you've accepted and put the right pro uh, processes in place. I wish I could say to you that I have the answer to overcome the old boys club. Um, I've seldom experience that in my industry and I think that once you've got one good customer and you've established your business it's so much easier then to build from that I'm not sure blue chip companies are where you should be starting either but I don't know the size of this organization I think it's Devi that has asked the question mm -hmm. um, no that was another one it's very hard to actually to guard them because it is very challenging to work with these big companies they sometimes mm -hmm. prefer to work with the suppliers they know but get get to understand what's happening in the enterprise development space because in that area they are forced to look at new suppliers absolutely and, um, add to that just in terms of diversity thank you candice and i um i agree with the points that were made by nikki and kathy on diversity and how you drive change in the in the corporate environment, I just want to add a point that, which, which is which is which is um, follow up to what Kathy has mentioned around not undermining your sphere of influence. I did say in the in the initial in my initial comment that one of the things that we need to we need to, um, to focus on in driving change is understanding our own selves and what 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 impact we want to to drive when we're in the positions that we're holding. So the, own, the, the sole reason for diversity is bringing the diverse thinking. And the only, the only way you can accommodate diverse thinking is, is, is taking, accepting that everyone is different. Everyone has a different experience. Everyone comes from a different background. Therefore, the reason why we're all in the one place is so that we can we can benefit from each other's experiences and each other's experiences and um, expectations. So you sitting there as a woman who has a certain expectation of what needs to, uh, the environment needs to be, but you not voicing that out, it means that you're depriving yourself an opportunity to make a difference that can be meaningful, not just for yourself, but for other people like you. If we don't uh, bring in those different views that we have around the table, it means that we're defeating the whole purpose of diversity because the main reason that we are all there and we are all different is so that we bring in those voices. So the, and you keeping quiet in that environment, if we talk about um, uh, policies, we talk about policies and rules, the policies, are they talking to the things that are, are inclusive? Are they talking to, are they accommodating every different person who is covered or is um, who's supposed to be working under that environment. So if we want to drive change, we need to be able to bring in our diverse thinking, put our, uh, our voice or, uh, and say our word and, and make sure that our contribution is that which then um, um, brings in that, that, that diverse voice and be able to, to make the environment different. So what my, my biggest point is once you expect change to come, from someone else who doesn't think like you, who doesn't know what you are expecting, it's very difficult for that person to be in your shoes. So once, when you have something different that you're expecting and you know, and, and you want to drive, bring in that voice. That's the sole reason why diversity needs to be encouraged. It's there for that purpose. That diverse thinking needs to be put on the table. Absolutely, Nangam. So I've got a question from Devi saying, as a woman or captain in finance, do you feel you have to prove yourself more over your male counterparts, or do you feel there's more parity now? 
Um, Debbie, it's, it's quite an interesting, it's a, quite an interesting question because um, different people have different experiences or different people handle circumstances differently. I would say that, I mean, you come into an environment, you learn the environment and then it's up to you how to respond to what you see in that environment and how you rise above it. So yes, there, there are instances in, in the financial services sector where you see that there's, there's, there's injustice, if I, wanna, if, if I want to be a bit of, of extreme. There's injustice. How you then place yourself in a position where you can rise above it, you can voice it. There, there are instances where, I mean, there's a book that, um, that I, I still love where this is, um, I'm not sure if it's in here. No, it's in the book that says, uh, nice girls don't get the corner office. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the lessons in that book is that the playing fields are not level. Don't get there and fool yourself. Don't kill yourself and think that when you being assertive as a woman, someone, someone is going to see you as assertive. Someone else is going to see that as being bossy or as being bully or, or a different way. But how do you assert yourself? Firstly, you need to assert yourself. Secondly, you need to be able to say to yourself, I know what I know. I, I know I'm here to contribute. I've got something to contribute. Therefore, I'm not going to be disrupted. Somebody's not going to shift me away from the core reason why I, I mean this. I mean, it, it, takes, it takes a lot more effort to, because you need to focus on doing what you're here to do. But at the same time, you're fighting other biases and other struggles that, are, that, that have a potential of disrupting you along the way. So it is that, but it, it really needs you to know how you keep rising about those and, and keep focusing on what your goal is. I think the next two questions I'm gonna link hand in hand for Kati and Namgang, so if you can just have a, a listen to these. So what are some of the major sustainability projects we can look forward to in 2021? And what are financiers like the DBSA doing to support these, these initiatives? And then it links into the, the other question, does the transport and women sector include sea transport? And if so, how are women doing in this sector? So um, looking forward to sustainability initiatives in 2021, let me start off with Grinrod and then I can go a bit wider. So I'm very excited to advise, we're in the process of building our auto port in Umlas Road. Um, and that was based on listening to customers and understanding their needs. So again, it goes to communication. It goes to being customer centric. And um, the difference in this auto port is that we are including social impacts as well as environmental impacts. So we've designed, and I'm using the Royal We because obviously I was part of uh, no, I'm joking. I, I played a role, but um, not that much. So um, we're designing the um, facility for solar panels so that we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, which is really important, and drive from fossil fuel-based um, electricity to green electricity. Um, in fact, yesterday, our water specialist was on site, very exciting, to understand how we can um, introduce a, a closed-loop uh, water management system um, so that we can reduce the water extraction from the municipality. We all know that South Africa is an arid country and we know that water security um, next to climate change is going to be one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face in South Africa. So I'm very excited about that part that we're playing. Um, and then also reducing the waste, understanding the waste streams. How do you become a lot more innovative and mature in the way that you deal with your waste so that you can move towards a circular economy. You know that the life and the capitalist system at the moment is, is geared towards a linear approach. So you've got your inputs, you've got your business processes, you've got your products and services and then waste. Whereas if you can turn it to a circular economy that you reduce your waste and that the waste then ultimately becomes the input product of, of another business if it doesn't fit into your own business. That is the trick that we want to get to. So that's on this the Green Road front. And then from an international space, um, I, I follow thought leaders and Maersk comes to mind. And obviously Maersk is quite a big 
customer in our business as well. And they have now recently um, introduced and announced that they are establishing a research foundation, which is very exciting. Because you know shipping contributes about 3% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but boy, it is a lot. And 90% of all things are still moved by ships. So um, their whole goal is to address this transition, a just transition to a low carbon economy. Um, and the idea is to become net carbon zero by 2050. So that's quite a big, hairy, audacious goal. And they're going to get there. I, I'm, I have no doubt in my mind. So they're looking at hydrogen as an energy carrier um, that can then power ships as well as processes. Can you imagine, for example, producing steel from green hydrogen power? I mean, just can you imagine the options? So that, those are two big things that's happening in the, in the space. Awesome. Um, guys, I have been given the, the red light to, to wrap up. Nikki and Ngamsa, I don't know if you've got anything else that you would like to add before I close the session and hand over to Kelly again. Okay, I just want to respond partly on the question around what DBSA is doing to, to advance women participation in the transport sector. Well, the, the, the bank has a BE policy that is meant to support investments led by BE parties. And there's a particular focus for businesses that are led and, and, and managed and owned by women. So one of the initiatives we, we are um, working with the World Bank on, is the, which is in support of the Sustainable Development Goals, is look at the issues of sustainable mobility. And when you look at sustainable mobility, one of the areas that we have to look deeply into is, is, the, is the issue of inclusivity, which means that you have to look at where the children and women are being accommodated. So this exercise is fortunately for us done in parallel with the work we're doing with government, with uh, provincial and local government in the country, where we look at what are their aspirations in, in advancing and transforming the taxi industry in particular. And our aim is to make sure that while we do that work, we include, include, we bring in inclusivity, make sure that as we transform the industry, we transform it, but at the same time, we make sure that we bring in the, 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 the diversity and include women as owners and operators of the systems. So that's, that's one area. So it's, it's, it's very important that we, 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 we talk about the, the investment focus around women-led businesses, women-owned um, businesses. So this is an opportunity if, if anyone is interested in having better conversation around this issue, we can pick up this conversation and see what opportunities there are. We are really, really as a bank struggling to find um, bankable opportunities in this space. And this talks again to the issue of networking. Yes, we have the products on the side, but there's an industry that may not know that there's, there's an opportunity that they need to take it, um, into consideration. So it, it, we, we can pick up this conversation. I don't want to dwell much on it, but it is a, is an area that the bank is focusing on. Thank you, Nangamso. Um, Nikki, anything further you'd like to add? No, I think that was really important to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. Gamsana, thank you for that. And, you know, um, as I said in the beginning of my speech, I don't believe that um, um, transport is about gender. I think we can prosper in this space alongside one another. There may be a couple of hurdles we might need to overcome. I remember in the beginning stages of my career, I used to get challenged all the time on the components of a truck. Um, and I would have to answer silly questions to justify my role. But I think those days have moved on and companies, um, and if they haven't and you're working with that sort of mindset, I would move out of that space. Women belong in this industry. We have a role to play in a very positive one. Um, we're going to bring a different element and a different flavor to the transport sector. And I think we just need to hang in there, find the solutions that work with you, find the sector that you really enjoy and that you're passionate about. Um, because you need that. This is a tough industry. It's a 24-7 industry that requires a tremendous amount of personal resilience um, to sustain yourself. And I'd like to end off by saying that one of the things that 
and I mentioned quite a few failures through my speech was that I didn't take care of myself during my time as a transporter. And it took me to get right to the end of that business career to realize how sick I'd actually become. Um, and I have spent a year and a bit having to work on that since then. Look after yourselves while you build businesses um, because women tend to put everything else for, uh, above all. And when you can't look after yourself and you can't run your business, you're useless to everyone. So, and your family will suffer along with that. So please take care of yourself. Um, find that strength. Find those brilliant ecosystems to work with you and those supporting networks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nikki. And thank you to all the panel members for their contribution today. I think the takeouts for me from today's session is definitely that we need to empower women in this space. We need to create awareness and ensure that women's security um, in the transport system and stimulate behavioral change, which I think is key to the, the, the points that we discussed today. So over to you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Candice, and many thanks for joining us this morning. A big thank you to our partner, More Global, and of course, our all-female panel, Nikki, Carthy, and Nanhamso. Women in transport is an important theme, and we are delighted that we could host this webinar during Women's Month. The recording of this discussion will be made available in the upcoming week, and I wish you all a pleasant day, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.